Hello everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Fire Dev. Today my guest is Yara Tabara. Yara, how are you doing? Hi, thank you for having me. I'm good. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. I, you know, I'm excited to finally, you know, do this podcast. <laughs> uh, how long had we been going back and forth? Was it has it been a year now? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. A few, a few months at least, maybe yeah, more than six been, months. So I'm yeah, happy it's been to a be a little while, you know, going back yeah. and forth. But yeah. you no, know, you know, I was adamant, you know, to get you on. You know, you're working for Ubisoft. Obviously, you know, we'll dive into that in a yeah. second. And, you know, you, you, you're very influential on LinkedIn as well. You know, you've got mm-hmm. a bit of a following. And uh, uh, that's also something else I want to, you know, discuss as well is how mm-hmm. LinkedIn is kind of becoming like a, a go-to social platform where you want to kind of cut out, I guess, the noise and the bullshit, uh, yeah. but still have kind of a social platform because you got guys like Amir Satva, Aida Figueroa, yeah. and, and a few others. I'm sure you know those names as well. Absolutely. And a few others as well. And they've really carved and you know, like, a space for yourself instead mm-hmm. of going on YouTube, Twitter, or I don't know, TikTok, for example, and mm-hmm. just using you know, LinkedIn. But you know, before we talk about that, do you want to talk about what you do in at Ubisoft? Yeah, sure. So I've been at Ubisoft for about three years now. Um, I started as um, a recruiter, so a talent acquisition specialist, only for the Montreal studio. But recently, a few weeks ago, almost a month ago, I think, uh, we became a national recruitment team. So that means that uh, my colleagues and I don't work for the Montreal office only, uh, but for all the studios within Canada. Uh, however, our role is still the same. So I'm still a talent acquisition specialist. Um, and my focus right now is the art community, but I've worked on multiple communities before. So programming, marketing, admin, um, animation, uh, I've worked on most of them. Okay, so when you're, you know, hiring these, you know, the talent, are you assigned to like a particular game and for the duration of either your assignment or the game's development, you're hiring artists and programmers for that game, or is it a matter of you're hiring, you know, the talent for, you know, Ubisoft and that gets distributed? Like, how, you know, how does it work? Mm-hmm. Basically, how much involvement do you have with the game versus, you know, just being, you know, higher level, you know, you need a coder, you need an artist? Mm-hmm. So usually when there is a need in a game to hire, let's say, artists or or programmers, um, this is communicated with us uh, by the producers uh, or the production managers. And then uh, we try to get as much information from the hiring managers. So let's say the leads or the directors uh, regarding what exactly is needed. Um, However, we're not working on one project. So every recruiter is working on all of the games that are being developed all across Ubisoft Canada. Uh, But each one of us has a specific community uh, so that we're specialized in a specific type of roles. Um, And that way we're able to, let's say, if, if we're hiring for one project, but that candidate did not work out for that project, we can find other projects that are suitable and and see transferable skills in between okay so your time at ubisoft you know so far what games have you hired for and what game are you currently working on (laughs) if you can say you know assuming it's announced yeah yeah i mean uh there are a lot of ongoing games so for titles that people are familiar with Um, Those I can mention, of course, there are also the unannounced games that I cannot talk about. But for the ones that I can uh, mention, uh, there's the Assassin's Creed games. Uh, So, for example, uh, there are newer Assassin's Creed games that were announced just under their code names. For example, there's Invictus, uh, there's Hexe, uh, there's also uh, the For Honor team. That's been ongoing live for a very long time. Um, and we also have the Rainbow Six Siege team. They also have an, an announced game, which is the Rainbow Six Siege Mobile. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and we have the Far Cry brand that we've been recruiting for for a long time. Uh, so those are, I think, the, the main titles that I've been recruiting for. Okay. Have you recruited for the most recent Assassin's Creed game that came out, Mirage? 
Actually, no, because Mirage was developed in France. So we did have some people from the Montreal team that helped them out at the end, uh, but it was mostly in France. So that's another recruitment team. Okay. And because, you know, Ubisoft is such a huge company and they have different studios, you know, around the world, how does it work in terms of which studio or like which country gets Mm -hmm. which game? Because, you know, you're saying Assassin's Creed alone, which has multiple games, that's developed in different countries. It's not even, Mm -hmm. oh, you know, one country or one studio gets a, a, a franchise. Like, they'll get different games in the franchise. So so how is that allocated? I think it's usually um, very senior team members, let's say our directors and producers that are pitching their ideas. Um, And therefore, uh, let's say there's a producer at Ubisoft Montreal with an art director and other team members uh, that pitch a specific Assassin's Creed game that they would like to work on, that's how it is decided that it is mainly for Ubisoft Montreal. Okay, fair enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that mm-hmm. that makes sense. And you know, what you know, what what's your favorite Ubisoft game? I'm sure oh, you Oh, that's a, a very good question. I think for emotional reasons, because I'll tell you why, it would be Assassin's Creed Valhalla, so it's pretty recent. Um, and that is because while I was really immersed in the game and while, while I was playing the game, um, I got in process, uh, the recruitment process with Ubisoft Montreal. So um, at the end, when I was, uh, I was given the role, uh, it was just when I was finishing the game. So it kind of all worked out together and, and made it like a memorable uh, memory regarding that game. Okay. And, Mm -hmm. you know, are you a big gamer yourself? Because, you know, looking at your LinkedIn profile, you've got a lot of work experience, but it's not really, you know, heavily game oriented. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, HR performance auditor for what office of the auditor general of, you know, Canada. I guess I'm guessing that's a government Government. position. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, why gaming and have you always been into gaming and you've, finally got into your passion yeah so i've never considered myself a gamer in the let's say traditional or official sense um i did i did grow up playing games um mostly on the pc um i don't know which generation you're from but it was all the you know aladdin and um uh, what else lion king and all these these disney games for example as well uh, other few games but um i did not have a console growing up um and then um i think a few years back so before i joined ubisoft i started playing console games um and since then i've been an occasional gamer sometimes i'm really immersed and i can play a big game like recently i finished uh, red dead redemption 2 uh, but I'm not always, always gaming. Uh, I take breaks in between, depending you know what's going on in my life. So I would say I'm an occasional gamer. And I kind of discovered the entertainment side of HR, let's say, by joining cinema before I joined games. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. I get a lot of people on the podcast that are in the gaming industry. Mm-hmm. And some of them, yeah, have been, you know, from like four years old they remember playing games and they would call themselves gamers you know all their yeah. life and then i've had people that have like a senior i had a, I had a guy who had a senior position at or who had a senior position at rovio before he started his own game studio and mm-hmm. he had never played a game previous to you know wow. starting at the studio and now not only is he in the game industry and heavily you know you know within it he loves games that he's become a gamer you know himself so you know you you know you get people like that but then you get people on the other side of the spectrum where uh, you know they've been gamers but they did like i had had a guy who did who did law and but he you know Mm -hmm. he wasn't you know and he worked as a lawyer but he wasn't quite for him so he retrained and became a project manager within you know the games in this the video games in industry Mm -hmm. so you know i that you get all sorts of stories and you know sound pretty similar you know to yours as you know well so you know why ubisoft do you know i'm guessing you applied to multiple or was ubisoft one that you really really wanted to work for when you decided to go into games 
so it's been three years so i'm trying to remember exactly um if i remember well i did apply for a few i did not only apply to ubisoft uh, but I was considered uh, for Ubisoft before that in the past. So I was already in contact with a few members of the recruitment team. Um, and I did uh, kind of, for me, it's important when I'm meeting with a team, when I'm interviewing, that um, I feel comfortable, that I feel that the, the culture of the team is something I would enjoy. Um, so meeting many team members of Ubisoft's recruitment team, I think, that really made me want to join uh, because it, it really seemed like a very fun team. Um, the, discu the discussion in the interview was very open and flexible. Uh, so it was a fun interview, actually. Okay. Uh, you know, I get questions all the time. You know, how do they, how, do, how does someone get into you know, the tech industry, you know, the video games industry? And, you know, the best people are always to, to speak to are people like yourself that, in, that's actually doing the hiring you know that's there yeah. you know on the ground even more than the coders and the artists that people want to become because they may be doing the job and that might you know provide some insight on how to do the job once you're there but in terms of getting through the door and then actually you know gain a seat at the table you know obviously mm -hmm. yourself yara would know more than most so let's mm -hmm. so you're working on you know art right now you know, what are the things that, you know, Ubisoft looks for? You know, the, the, you know, what are the necessities and what are those extra little things that they notice and think, oh, you know, we definitely need to speak to this individual. We need to hire mm -hmm. this one. Yeah, so um, actually, before I talk specifically about what we're looking for, there's one thing I noticed in the game community, and maybe we'll talk about it, about it a little bit more. Um, it's the networking so networking is so important, I think more than any industry I've been in. Um, and a lot of people um, get to join a gaming or even tech company uh, by finding the right people, uh, connecting with the right people, uh, building their own community or network on LinkedIn mostly. Um, however, when we're looking for, in terms of skill set, when we're looking for people, a lot of the time, uh, even, you know, not only in art, but in, in different departments, we're looking for people who can showcase uh, problem solving skills, leadership skills. So being able to be proactive uh, when you're working on your tasks on, or on your project to kind of um, go the extra mile a little bit and, and find solutions and find new ideas. Okay. And, you know, what about specifics, you know, for programmers, mm -hmm. for artists, you know, are there, you know, is there something, you know, specifically they're looking for? And mm -hmm. also how important, again, this is another thing that a lot of people, you know, ask, how important is having a degree? Because, you know, mm -hmm. artists and especially programmers or programming is a are fields where you have professional degrees set up and you can go and get a degree. But you can equally do the training for even little to no or little to no money and get the job, you know, as well. Like there's there's very few fields, you know, like that. Like you either have fields where you don't do any training at all, um, or yeah. maybe an apprenticeship, or you have fields where you have to do training, you know, like a doctor or a lawyer. Otherwise, you can't get your foot through the door. It's just not possible, and it's actually illegal, you know, to practice, yeah. you know, those, you know, fields as well, if you don't have the appropriate qualification. Well, the program as an artist, it's not a necessity. So how important is it during the hiring process at you know, Ubisoft? So if you don't need a work permit, if you're not an international mm -hmm. candidate, you usually don't need to have a specific degree uh, or certificate, especially in arts. In programming, uh, it is recommended it is something we look for most of the times it depends on the team um, so in programming it's a little bit more strict i would say but um, we did hire different types of profiles throughout you know the the three years i've been there and sometimes there are exceptions uh, it really depends i think on the on the candidate so for us what is really important uh, in either departments is being able to showcase your skills and that is usually by having a website or a portfolio of some sort. Uh, a lot of people think that because they don't have professional experience, they cannot have a website or a portfolio. But that's actually very wrong because we care the most 
about personal projects. Even if someone has a lot of experiences, uh, showing that you actually are passionate about this, that you have other skills you can show, uh, being able to show material that usually, let's say, you can't show if it's on a on a, on a specific game, uh, like showing your process, uh, that is very, very important in, in either departments. So, you know, having a portfolio, uh, you mm-hmm. know, there's a few different, you know, ways that you can obviously go about it, different platforms. You know, is there a specific platform for, let's say, programmers and for artists that, you know, you generally, you know, prefer? I think for programmers, the most common one we see and therefore the most, the, the one we're most comfortable with is GitHub. Yeah. Um, so otherwise, people sometimes make their own websites. That's very common for both programmers and, and artists. And for artists, it's usually ArtStation. Uh, the one that's most common. Otherwise, people can sometimes make a video out of their work. So they post it on uh, Vimeo or YouTube. Um, there are other sites, but I don't really, we don't really prefer them. Uh, like Wix, uh, Behance sometimes. We do prefer the way uh, artwork is presented on ArtStation or if someone wants to just make their own website and, and kind of customize it. Okay. And... You know, because Ubisoft's a big company, one thing I find, you know, with big companies is the hiring process can be quite strenuous on, you know, the candidate. It can take quite a long time. How is that for Ubisoft? You know, typically, once the job, you know, uh, in listing goes out, somebody, you know, does an interview. From, from doing the interview to them actually starting, how long would you say that is? So usually um, I can speak about Ubisoft Montreal or Ubisoft Canada since we're we're becoming national, as I mentioned. Uh, Usually for artists, um, we have one screen call. So that would be, let's say, for example, with me and then one uh, video call or meeting with the team. Um, And then after that, we're able to make a decision and make an offer if you want to proceed with them. Uh, It's very, very important for us that we make the process as simple and as friendly as possible, because as you mentioned, it can be very stressful and and very long. Um, We avoid tests as much as possible for artists. So usually if someone uh, provides us with a portfolio, there is no need for us to to make them do a test, Um, especially if their portfolio is um, is in real time, so how we work in game in a similar uh, pipeline uh, that is perfect. And in in programming, it's a little bit different because um, most teams actually do ask for a test to confirm the skills, uh, so the level of the skills. That way, they know uh, how the programmer can contribute in the team and and what level if they're senior or not. So usually, there's a screen call and then a, one meeting with the team and then a small test. Uh, for for them to to do during the weekend or you know whenever they're they're free, um, but yeah, that's that's about it. We try to keep it simple. We don't want a long process. So the test for the programmers is so you've mentioned that you know they could do it on the weekend or you know when they get some time. So I'm guessing it's not a matter of you have to jump on a call. You have one hour in front of someone to do the test. Do you not do live tests then? I'm not sure anymore since I haven't been recruiting and programming for about a, a, a year, maybe a bit more. Um, but when I was involved, it was not a live test. Um, yeah. However, this could change because I did hear a lot about how AI is affecting uh, tests mm-hmm. and how they need to make sure that person completed the test and, and they did not cheat. So that's actually very possible uh, that now it is it is live. Yeah. I mean, I'm personally as a programmer, I'm not mm-hmm. a big fan of mm-hmm. live tests yeah. just for the simple reason, like you have an hour or so, just the way an exam, you might have like a bad day or a bad hour. Mm-hmm. And I think that might not be truly, you know, representative of, you know, of the work that you can do. But like, what's your opinion on it? Like, it, it, mm-hmm. ignoring the AI side of it, you know, like mm-hmm. ChatGPT and where you can generate. And even then, that is you know part of the future and those tools will will need to be leveraged if studios are want you know want to remain relevant but ignoring that if ai wasn't a thing would you opt for live tests or would you say okay you know you have a test you've got a week or so a few days to do it 
you go you just go away and do it i for me what is important is making the process as easy as 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 friendly as possible so i always opt for the for the option that's better for the candidate so i would think that having tests uh, that are not live would be ideal i think worst case like there are different ways to go about it to kind of make sure there's no cheating uh, you're a programmer so you probably know probably know a bit more about that um, or maybe recording it or something like that but having live tests as you mentioned can be a little um inconvenient and stressful yeah and, and intimidating as well yeah because i feel like if you know you're working at ubisoft or any of the company for them you know for that matter if let's say your managers or somebody is just standing over your shoulder for eight hours a day that would be very yeah. intimidating you know to do your work because you'll be very afraid that you oh you're gonna make a mistake and you would usually you know google stuff go on youtube go True. on stack overflow you know, f- figure stuff out, uh, and by the end of the day or the end of the week, you like the your what you're working on might be fine, but that process, you know, it's it's like saying you don't want to see how the sausage is made sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, especially when you've only got an hour or two, because you know these tests, especially the live ones, aren't that long. You know, you really don't have much time to you know work things out and you know make mistakes. So yeah, like personally that's the reason i'm not a big fan of it just because i wouldn't want somebody watching me whilst i'm doing the work actually on the job but you know yeah i can see the merit for it you know the reasoning yeah i agree with you i think any of us if we're doing something and someone's watching us it's just so stressful um so i agree It, it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense to put candidates through that uh, if you're able to, let's say, interview them, ask them the, the, the questions that you think is important when you're hiring them, uh, making sure they have the right knowledge. Uh, also, if they have their own website, they've built certain tools or anything like that. You can see, you can get an idea of their level, so you don't need to micromanage them during the test. Okay. And, you know, going to the artist side of things, you said that, you know, they'll provide their, pro, you know, their portfolio and they'll have a look at their work you know what checks are done to see if the work that they put on there is their person's work Mm -hmm. because you know i'm not an artist i'm not a somebody that can really draw but i could easily google stuff and get a bunch of you Mm -hmm. know drawings or images or artwork and put it into a portfolio especially stuff that i know isn't really that popular so you're probably not going to know of it and yeah. like I could, I could give that to someone that doesn't make me capable of you know doing artwork so how do you weed that out like to know that that person okay that person provided a portfolio but what's in there is actually his yeah so that's a that's a very good question uh usually while we're recruiting artists uh there are two things that could help us figure out if they actually did the work or not uh, the first thing is that when we're looking at their portfolio with them, we kind of ask them what challenges they went through. Let's say we're focused on one piece. So what challenges, what challenges they went through during that piece, uh, what their process was, uh, how they got from A to Z, what tools they use, how they did it, how much time it took them. So you can generally tell uh, with their answers. And another thing is that it's very important for us that they actually show the process. So they don't they don't just put the 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 end piece, uh, but they put the process. So the the first sketch, let's say the rough sketch, and then the you know the the line work, uh, the color work. So that's talking about concept artists, for example. But it depends on on their line of work. Uh, we could usually see the process and see if if it's something they did themselves. Okay, so you know, mm-hmm. showing the different stages. So if they're working yes. on like a character drawing, for example, yeah. instead of just having the final, you know, product show, you know, show if there's five different drawings, it's more likely to, you know, be theirs because they're, they're less likely to have access to that. I guess. Exactly. It, I mean, it, is it valued if so, not all of it? It's, it's mm-hmm. not always practical, but if if there's some pieces where they've re- literally recorded the process maybe on youtube and you know you can see them actually you know figuring it out and experimenting and you know going through it from start to finish as well is that valued or not really yeah 
absolutely that is very rare though i think we've mm. we've rarely had any people uh send us a video of their process it's usually just pictures but that absolutely will be a great thing especially for hiring managers okay and you know in the world we live in right now it's become very remote in terms of you know the working How, you know what's ubisoft's stance on that and where we are now definitely companies are trying to get people back into the offices so how is ubisoft handling that so you no know, two parts one you know what is the remote policy in general and two mm-hmm. are they trying to crawl you know you know get it back a bit and get people back in the office as you you know you've seen some companies do yes so um different locations have different requirements for mm-hmm. example uh ubisoft in the us you can work from anywhere within the us uh ubisoft toronto you can work remotely from ontario uh, however ubisoft uh in montreal uh you need to work on a hybrid schedule so that is usually two times a week at the office but of course there's still a lot of flexibility in a way that we know people have appointments we know people have families uh, so there is the flexibility there if something's not recurring every week it's fine to have exceptions um and uh, usually we the montreal office has been trying to implement uh, things to motivate people to go to the office to give them a bit of a more of a reason because the whole point is of going is being able to collaborate and communicate and network with people and have fun so it has to be different from working from home and um therefore teams are required to have most of their meetings on the days where they're at the office that way they can have those meetings live not from behind screens and uh there there's been a lot of different activities uh, added on the schedule a uh, little perks here and there just to kind of motivate people as well so how has you know hiring you know changed with this huge shift in remote working because i remember like four or five years ago pre covid mm-hmm. trying to get a remote position was rare like it was super like the hybrid role would be one day a week at home four days in the office and that's after you've you know yeah. probably worked a few years at the company and that and even that most people considered a huge bonus and amazing whereas now so you know you see two days in in the office a week or one day even office in the week you know as a hybrid role and you're like that's not good enough i need it fully 100% mm-hmm. remote so, so how has recruitment tried to you know cope with that and also handle that yeah so actually since remote work has become a big option for everyone uh it has become more difficult to recruit international candidates so a lot of the hiring we do relies on international hiring and in the past uh, usually with our relocation packages uh that are very very good we were able to kind of get people interested in moving and and coming on to this new adventure uh but right now because we have the opportunity to work with small or big studios remotely uh they are more hesitant to to move uh, especially if they have families or it's if it's a little complicated because they have the opportunity to do that with other studios without moving so that's become more difficult actually um to to get their attention and and get them to say yes to that okay fair enough yeah i mean that makes sense and it, it is something you know that is you know difficult and but it, it's something i feel like over the next few years you know will be figured out and that middle ground you know will be yeah. found you know personally what do you prefer because when you're you know recruiting people you know a big mm-hmm. part of it is that connection because you're only with that person for an hour or two and maybe you mm-hmm. it sounds like with Ubisoft not many you know meetings as well because I've heard companies like Google where there's a lot of back and forth it can be 6 to 12 months before somebody's hired if it's not like that you only have a, maybe a few hours with somebody you know do you, are you fine with remote or do you prefer being able to sit in the same room shake that person's hand look in their eyes you know before you hire them so what's mm-hmm. your stance on you as, as a recruiter I 
I know each recruiter would respond to this differently, but I am very, very flexible and I'm okay with uh, having the process completely remote. Um, I did feel like before the whole uh, pandemic and, and remote work, um, I used to connect with candidates a little bit more. It was a little bit easier uh, to to kind of build that connection when I'm meeting with them. Uh, but throughout the pandemic, I discovered the whole world of, of LinkedIn, uh, as we mentioned, and, and I started connecting with people a bit more by having content, building a network there, um, virtually meeting with people from, from LinkedIn. So that has helped me a lot in uh, learning more about these candidates and um, building a connection that's for the long term. Uh, so that's how I coped with it, and I'm and I'm fine. I'm fine with calling people or having a video call before hiring them, uh, because so far, let's say in the past two years, it has not proved that it is bad in any way or negative. I still make very very good quality hires, great people, a lot of talent. So it hasn't really shown, like it hasn't shown that it's a negative thing or that I'm missing on some cues. Okay. And, you know, you touched on something that we, you know, discussed at the start, which was the whole world of, you know, LinkedIn, <clears throat> yeah. you know, especially with, I find especially with recruiters as well. There's a lot of recruiters, you know, on LinkedIn that are really making like their own little world and like a carving out a niche yeah. you know, for themselves. And they're almost becoming, you know, like rock stars on you know LinkedIn I, I mean it naturally it lends itself well to recruiters just as a professional platform outside of you know posting so mm -hmm. you know that makes you know sense how long have you been actively using LinkedIn not as a platform where you've effectively got an on online CV but mm -hmm. like a social network you know the way that uh, Amir Satvat does you know for example yeah probably probably about two years or maybe two years and a half now i think since the pan since the pandemic really so i joined mm. ubisoft and a few months later i started doing that because i was working completely remote at that time um but yeah it has evolved a lot as you're saying for the past few months i think it's it's just getting crazier and crazier it i keep is. seeing everyday posts from everyone but especially recruiters as you said um, and it is great, but also we have to take care because everybody's giving advice left and right. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes some people kind of get addicted to that mini fame. So you kind of have to see, you know, who to follow. And as you mentioned, there's there's a lot of noise and it's getting bigger and bigger. So, you know, it's important to see who has the experience and who you want to follow and get the advice from. And just take things with a grain of salt, as we say, because um, different recruiters will give you different advice and talk about different things, but it's not always the things that will work for you or that will work for every company. Oh, yeah. And that advice of taking with a grain of salt, that's really applicable to any social you know, platform. True. Facebook, Twitter, you know, especially because there's a lot of misinformation, a yeah. lot of bad actors on there you know, TikTok as well. But the problem with LinkedIn is because it's a professional, uh, you know, a platform for professionals. And if you look at the posts, you know, they are very professionally written structured posts. Yeah. Like it, they are not the sort of posts that that person, if they have a Facebook account, is putting on Facebook. Like it is totally different. Very, I mean, I'm trying to think if I've ever seen a Facebook-like post on LinkedIn. People generally don't do it because, you know, it's their career the livelihood that's at stake and i feel like because of the professional veneer that's on top of it it's almost easy to you know mistake it for fact you know for yeah. it being right because you see you know you see something on facebook or you know tiktok or something and you're like oh this is clearly you know not right because the way the person posted it is clearly a joke like, there's no actual yeah. professional effort that's put into it. Whereas on LinkedIn, there'll be, like, an A4 essay on something. And now mm -hmm. when you have do have, you know, AI tools like Ch Ch ChatGPT, and people are able to generate really long posts without the effort, but even if they have to put in effort, 
because they write it so well, they probably proofread it multiple times. You see it and you think, there's no way that can realistically be incorrect, you know, or yeah, misinformation from a bad actor. Where, uh, but it, it's more than possible. And I feel like LinkedIn, like I think, I think LinkedIn as a company needs to, in the future, figure out a way of identifying those posts and bad actors and you know figure out a way of i I don't know about verifying posts but have Mm -hmm. something there that says okay this is more trusted i know they got these like the top voices in you know the particular sector i know know you got those sort of accolades but the post itself yeah, and and I think LinkedIn is starting to to see that need because they did start the whole verify your profile. Did you mm. did you do that? Are you aware of it? I don't. If I did it, I can't remember. It might have. Okay. I, I might have done it just because it was one of those things. Do you know, like when you have to change your password? Yeah. Uh, yeah exactly. Like if if I have done it, I don't remember. But yeah, okay. Talk a little more about that. That would be interesting to yeah. hear. Yeah. So they're asking people to verify their profile by adding their work email for the company they work for so that LinkedIn can verify Mm. that, but also add, um, send an application with like the, the, a picture of their, their official ID and their phone number and, and a bunch of information so that people can have that tick next to their profile that says they're verified. So they really work at that place and they're a real person. I think that's something they're starting to do. Maybe you haven't gotten... gotten no, I, uh, I definitely yet. do not remember okay. having to put a work. Yeah. I, I mean, but that's interesting to me because you, someone like yourself, you work at Ubisoft, you will have a Ubisoft email, you will have Ubisoft some sort of, you know, ID card, for example, and same with someone that works at, you know, EA or Google or Microsoft. But why if there's someone on there that is a genuine person they're a freelancer, uh, you yeah. know, or a contractor, for example. They don't have a work email. Maybe they've just got a personal Gmail, but they're doing really well making websites locally for local businesses. But they've got a, like a, just a regular at Gmail, you know, email address, and they've got no obviously, you know, you know, ID card. Like, mm-hmm. how do how do how do those people get verified? Because it's a matter yeah. of if you're in that camp or something similar, but you're genuine you just don't have the same level of trust, you know, bestowed upon you on the platform just because you don't work for a big company? Because, again, that's yeah. very unfair as well. It is, and, and it's tricky, and it's unfair because, let's say, I was able to verify myself just by putting my Ubisoft email. Mm-hmm. What if someone, as you're saying, they're freelancer, and what if they don't want to put their official ID, like their passport or a driver's license, because I don't know if you can trust the system is enough there's not much information out there about it uh for you to actually take a picture of your id and then it's it's so it's tricky and i don't know if it's gonna work all the way since it's still new i don't know if everybody's gonna have to do it at some point uh but it does seem it does seem unfair as you're saying um and as well as you mentioned the the community top voices so the like the gold badge that would be on the profile um, I I stopped uh, doing what I need to do to get it because I realized that it is a bit misleading. Um, basically, you have to contribute on one article that is usually AI generated. Um, so you just have to comment uh, on that article. And if you get enough likes on your comment, then you get the badge and then you have to keep doing it to keep that badge. So... I'm not sure how reliable it is, actually. Yeah, they, they, that is a problem with systems like that. They can be easily, you know, gamed. You know, yes, you, exactly. you know, you can easily con it because you know, if it's a matter of you need to have made X amount of posts with X amount of sort of interaction, mm-hmm. you could buy that. Like, I, I don't know if there's, you know, people selling LinkedIn you know, sort of interaction, you know, the way you can buy Facebook likes and Twitter, mm-hmm. your reshares on likes. If there isn't, people will be, because that yeah. will be a big market soon. But you know, yeah, like stuff like that can be gamed pretty easily, or you could create a bot yourself, you know, exactly. to do it. So yeah, it is, you know, how does 
LinkedIn, you know, handle that. And then also going forward, I I don't think it's long till LinkedIn tries to, you know, you know, working obviously with the people that are making the posts, the actual users, m- figuring mm-hmm. out a way to monetize and allowing people to monetize their posts. Because right now, you know, you got yourself and other people like Amir Sattva, they're making all these posts. You might get business connections off yeah. what you're posting and you might be able to network, but that's indirect. You're not, you're not getting money because it gets a million or a thousand, you know, views or you know thousand people clicking on your post so you know how do you think that might go down with linkedin potentially monetizing it and do you want to see that happen and how would you like to see that happen i think when so if it's gonna become like that if if money is gonna get involved or promotions I think it's gonna make it like other social media where you see even more and more noise and competition that is not healthy. And um, I think the main point of, of us right now writing on LinkedIn and reaching out to people is to, to work on the community, to build each our own communities as recruiters, to be able to build long-term relationship with people, hire them in the future, um, help them out as well. A lot of us do this because, uh, you know, it's something we're specialized in. We have a lot of information. We can share it and we can help people who don't have this information. So I'm personally not looking forward uh, for the monetization part. I know, as you mentioned, I think at some point it's going to happen. Um, but I don't think it's going to be a very positive, I mean, I'm sure it can have positive outcomes, but I don't see exactly how it can be that positive for, let's say, recruiters or the community at a whole when, when you make it superficial like that. What what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I know what you mean, because it, it's a professional platform. And if they yeah. want to stick to it being a professional platform, you know, one, how are they even going to? monetize it is it in the typical youtube face uh, you know facebook or tiktok style fashion where you know the more interaction you generally get from your posts the more money that you make or is it something else where maybe you know people are a fan of you know your post you know yara tabara's post mm-hmm. and then you can maybe have a subscribe only you know set of mm-hmm. posts you know, at, oh, you know as well okay. and that could be quite interesting where you could pay mm-hmm. $5 a month and you could get your exclusive post. Obviously there's a side of, will you as an individual post less for free and then yeah. you post more paid. But I feel like if that happens, you'll probably get less users coming in on the free side of it. And if there's some sort of ranking uh, with you, can maybe you still need to maintain a certain level of activity Again, that could be very interesting and very mm-hmm. nice because I wouldn't want to, you know, be seeing, you know, advertise, you know, banner ads or something yeah, on, exactly. you know, on Yara or Amir's posts. Because right now, sometimes I do a bit of LinkedIn scrolling. I see some posts really well written. They can be very insightful, almost like, the, the, you know, you uncover some of the news that's going on as well, especially in the gaming and the tech world. Uh, but it is just a, it's just a post, maybe a video, uh, you know, attached with it as well. And an image, but there's no like banner ads or you know, or, you know, pre roll ads. You know, I don't want to see that on the platform. So it is, I, I feel like it will be some sort of subscribe to me kind of, you know, style, uh, you know, you know, side of it. And then how much of it is going to be the typical LinkedIn side of it where you go on there, it is a professional platform to try and put yourself out there, get a job, hire someone versus, okay, I'm just going to post on there and try and get a following to get, let's say a thousand followers or 10,000 followers. So I can have this subscription based model, which LinkedIn Mm -hmm. will push in some capacity. And as a result, I'm making money and maybe more money than my, you know, regular job. So I hope whatever they do, I hope they doesn't hurt the right now what is their core business which is yeah. effectively an online cv it is like a global True. online cv directory like if you take the timeline the front page timeline out of it it that's what it is it is a cv website yeah 
Yeah, that's very true. And um, I think it's important that whatever they do, they keep in mind uh, why people are on LinkedIn mm -hmm. uh, and what's important for them. Because I think they can, if they try something and it's it's risky, it can really, um, I don't know, it can really remove some of the the let's say the, pro the professional uh vibe that we have on linkedin so i don't i don't think anything that would bring a lot of noise would be ideal um as we said because there's already a lot of noise uh people trying to get 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 the 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 badges that they have the new badges the top voices for communities uh, or the official one um, and they're just starting to write more and more but content is so important on linkedin as you mentioned because it is not instagram and it's not facebook or twitter oh no it isn't when you first started using linkedin in this capacity what sort of things was you posting is it much different to what you post now and then you know also if you want to share with the audience you know what do you generally post yeah so i don't have a very specific structure that i follow at all actually whenever something comes up at work or even in my personal life that i think could be insightful uh, or could be helpful to people in my community, I write about it. So it's really just a moment of inspiration. Um, and usually I write a little bit about everything. So um, given my experience uh, working in cinema before games, I saw that there's actually um, a lack of transferring people from uh, cinema to games, and there's a lot of transferable skills that people were missing out on. Uh, so that's one of those things I started writing, writing about when I joined Ubisoft uh, to tell people about games and how it's similar to, to films and uh, how we have, you know, different titles, but it's technically the same role. Um, and then after that, I started writing a, a little bit of, you know, advice about recruitment. So when you're hired, what to do, networking, uh, what we look for in portfolios. So uh, advice about communities and roles and familiar with and, you know, certain situations where, let's say, certain people are messaging, messaging me about they have some questions and, and that question is getting repeated. So I would answer that question through, through a LinkedIn post. Okay. And, you know, do you do any video content or is it all you know, just written? And do you have like a YouTube channel, for example, or anywhere else you, you post? Or is it like you, you only post on LinkedIn for this kind of content? Yeah. So the only YouTube, not YouTube, the only video I have is on Twitch. Um, however, I've been only posting uh, on LinkedIn, just writing content. Uh, but one time I did a stream on Twitch uh, while playing Scott Pilgrim um, to uh, explain. It was mainly for people from film to kind of answer all their questions and explain our process and uh, talk about how they can transfer and what different titles mean. Uh, so I think that one is still on Twitch. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, recently over the last, let's say, 6 to 12 months, there's been a lot of layoffs in the gaming industry. How, yeah. you know, what's your opinion on that overall, you know, industry-wide? Why do you think it's happening? And how much has Ubisoft been contributing? Like, has Ubisoft been laying off a lot of people as well? So I think that when the pandemic started, um, the, everybody at home started consuming uh, films and games um, a lot more than they were used to because they had a lot more free time and all that stuff. Um, and I think that's when all the industries that work in, in, you know, in those areas started recruiting like crazy, thinking that it's going to be something that's consistent for the very long term. Um, and that's why I think we're seeing layoffs. However, I can speak only about um, Ubisoft Canada, mostly Ubisoft Montreal, since that's, you know, where I, I've been the most experienced. Um, we did have some layoffs, uh, but that was, that was, I think, about two months ago, and it was only on the admin side of things. So it was not in production teams, because we actually have been hiring a lot for production teams. We've had, you know, we have, I think, at least 10 games right now in production. Um, and uh, I've 
been recruiting like crazy on the art side as well. I know my colleagues have been recruiting a lot on the uh, in other areas. So it's really been more the admin side that w was affected, thankfully. And I know it's still going on, like the layoffs. We just heard about Unity, I think yesterday or a few days ago. Um, and then Eidos, I think. I'm not sure there was a third company. So there, there's a few companies uh, right now that are still going through layoffs. Oh yeah, Twitch actually is going through some layoffs. So I'm hoping like everybody else that it's gonna end soon because I'm not really, I'm not really sure. Um, I had hoped that by the beginning of the new year, which is now, things uh, would have been a lot better, but it doesn't seem like the industry is, you know, is improving as, as quickly as I hoped it would. So yeah, I mean, from the research I've done, that was my conclusion as well, that there was a lot of rapid hiring of the last two to three years, especially because, like you said, a lot of media was consumed, film, games, you know, for example, and gaming and tech companies, you know, mm -hmm. they obviously capitalized on it, they hired a lot of people, and a, a part of it was contractors, you know, that they hired, the, you know, they were never yeah. were meant to be permanent, and I feel like that gets grouped into, again, not to say that laying off staff even if they're on you know on a contract basis i've done a lot of contract work you know, over the years and you know st you know still continue to do so but you know it, it it's not you know, just a plain picture of you know x amount of layoffs you know happened you know it, they're a bit more to it and sometimes even after you factor in the layoffs the company is still larger in terms of you know employees than they were pre-covid so like they're growing it's just they had a little surge and now they're having to, you know, ju just, you know, correct for that. But with all these people that are getting laid off and continuing to get laid off, what do you think they do, like, right now? Because it's not like, oh, one company went down and mm -hmm. they've just gone back into the market and every other company is still hiring normally. The, like you're saying, every single day it feels like, there's a new company and this is just within gaming that i'm seeing there's other companies as well within tech in you know in general that yeah. you know you, you just see, like I said, you're seeing unity you're seeing this company you're seeing that company and they're just laying off people on mass so if they're laying them off and then the other 20 companies that you might go to also laying them off what do these tens of thousands of people do that are coming suddenly you know onto the job market yeah, that's a that's that's very difficult because I know some people have been trying to find a job for you know six months or or even more sometimes, so it's definitely definitely not easy times with this uh, economy. But what I try to tell people um, is that if they're able to motivate themselves to actually work on personal projects in the meantime that could really help them um, get a job sooner more easier or as soon as things pick up they you know they could be let's say prioritized uh, because having personal work as you mentioned it shows interest and passion and a dedication and wanting to to learn and grow um, and picking up new skills can actually keep you safer in the future um, so, for example, I know someone from the film industry who was let go um, and they've picked up a new skill they've learned working on Unreal, on real time, which is not usually something in, in films. Um, and they're really proud and they're going to now be able to apply not just to films, but also to games. So, like, finding new skills, trying to learn new things, I think that's the only thing you can do while waiting and while applying. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think any industry that you're in whilst even if you've got a job especially now where there's a lot of talk about you know ai something that you know i want to talk about mm -hmm. next but like we've all this talk about ai taking this and that job or disrupt disrupting it feels like every industry that people are predicting it, it's something that's not going to happen in a day or even in a year it's going to take a bit of time so i feel i think people need to be proactive in studying in tooling up in getting those new skills so that way when the time does come that ai just takes over 20 percent mm -hmm. of all of artists jobs right now you know there, there will be a market for certain skills within art for example 
but cool. they'll be different and it might be involved you know involving ai or it might be some other new tool or just niche in general and i feel like people just stand back and they don't take enough personal responsibility and see what's coming and and you know like i said reskill up learn a new skill and instead 10 years later they're wondering why they're out of a job now even though they yeah. saw the warning signs and they just it, it or you know or if it's like a truck driver for example or some other field where you know many of us just going to get wiped out eventually there's still many years to figure things out and figure out okay this isn't going to be around forever what do i do or you know being a taxi driver like technically we're almost there uh mm-hmm. in terms of government regulation there's the, the a fair bit to go especially in the uk but we're going to have self-driving cars on mass yeah really soonish yeah. but not overnight and even in the us it's still a, a while away but it's gonna happen mm-hmm. and so so it, because that's gonna happen truck drivers taxi drivers right now they need to be skilling up you know it might be become in, it's not necessarily going again degree it might be starting a trade electrician plumber whatever because those i don't see getting taken away by ai due to the you know the intricacy of what they're doing right now i feel like they're gonna be some of the last ones to go away and yeah, that's the, true, yeah, but yeah so what's your you know opinion you know on that yeah, I think um, I, I think people should not be scared. So what I notice a trend is that art, especially artists, they're very, very scared of AI and they take they have a very negative uh, perception of AI and they think it's going to take their job completely. But it's I don't think it's the case. I think people had the same fear when mocap was created. Someone told me that a few a few months ago and what it did is make their animators jobs more efficient um they stopped doing repetitive tasks let's say um and there was actually a high, much higher need for animators after mocap was out so um for us at, at ubisoft um we haven't been using ai to replace artists at all and we don't see it as a replacement. We see it more as potentially maybe one day being an enhancement in a way or another. Um, maybe if there's certain repetitive tasks or something like that, it could help. Um, but there, there's always going to be the need for that human touch, I think, uh, especially in, in games and in tech. I think even if AI becomes very much more developed, it's not going to fully replace anybody. It's just going to enhance uh, the work, make it quicker, more efficient. Um, and we do have a lot of uh, a lot of roles that might require using more AI. So if people start maybe learning more about it and uh, how they can leverage leverage it to their own benefit, I think that can help them much more than avoiding it. Okay. Uh, you know, so these AI tools, you know, you got ChatGPT, you got Bard, mm-hmm your dolly and the chat gpt store i think just launched today or yesterday as well for the you know the all, all, all their gpts you know how is ubisoft handling that are they you know factoring that into the recruitment is it something they want their programmers and their artists to be leveraging you know you know how are they you know doing that i think right now it's probably i don't really know any details but i think it's probably just like any other company maybe testing phase uh with uh, with uh, with everything uh but i like being in the art recruitment i don't see any discuss discussions about it replacing or um you know taking over or being leveraged at the moment to kind of make content or anything like that uh, is it becoming a requirement at all like mm-hmm. on applications so not taking over a job but saying okay mm-hmm. having experience using one of these chat gpt tool you know these ai tools if not for you know the end product you know the end piece of art but maybe for some concept stage stuff where you can easily whip something up like i mm-hmm. find it very beneficial for that side of it um because mm-hmm. it doesn't need to be that precise and you know the legal side of it is because you're not publishing the you know the images it's not that big of a deal like is there any talk about that or putting that as a requirement for candidates 
So definitely not a requirement at all. Uh, but I could I could see it maybe becoming part of the process at the beginning, like you said, like rough rough ideas, maybe like just very very quick rough ideas at the beginning of a project, for example. I don't know, but for now, on my end, I, there's nothing like that happening. There are no requirements uh, at all for the moment. Okay, so no requirements right now Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know what is your opinion on these you know ai tools do you think they're good for the industry or do you think they'll have a negative impact on the industry it's tricky because i think they can be used in a way that is negative um i think a lot of people are afraid that their work is gonna be kind of quote unquote quote unquote stolen or um their style at least and that is a very valid worry um because ai is you know it's very powerful and and resourceful and it's becoming more and more like that as we go um but i think it can have as we mentioned some positive outcomes you know just making certain things uh less repetitive and and quicker um but it's it's I don't think it's clean yet. I don't think it's at the level yet. And I don't know if it will be. Uh, you probably know better. But um, I think people should just um, learn a bit more about it and see what the limitations are and what the possibilities are. And at the same time, um, I do recommend that people keep their own personal work protected. So let's say when you have a website or a portfolio and you're, you know, you're applying for jobs, you can always have a password. Uh, to protect your work and that way you you know you're not anxious about that yeah also uh, you know potentially put some sort of like watermark on there as well yeah. like, you know that i mean that could help not just ai in general but like that can just help you know in general like have some sort of watermark and then you know with you know employers or people that are a bit more trusted you can send a non-watermarked version if required mm-hmm. but you know having something like that or like I said behind some sort of password war can definitely you know help and yeah I, i've been using chat gpt a lot i use mm-hmm. it every single day and i don't think it's there yet to the level that people are afraid but i i feel like people are not take the vast majority of people are not like either not using it yet or they're not using it that much like it's an occasional okay they've checked it out and that's it I, in my mind, I'm like, how is anybody that is doing anything on a computer, especially using the web, not using it, you know, actively? You know, the way that people Google, like, yeah. how are you not using it for that, for to create, you know, certain content, you know, templates to search for stuff, to manipulate data? There's just so much power to it. And now with the GPT stuff, the GPT store, it's crazy. I, I was look. I was on the GPT store earlier on, and there was a custom GPT created by I can't remember what company it was. But it's a pretty big video, I mean, editing company, and you could with a with a, with a few prompts explain like a video that you want created. I just created like an economics video based on inelastic and elastic supply and demand, and I because I thought you know that should be relatively easy to get you know b-roll for you know pretty yeah. easily and it did such an amazing job with it i, I again i need to because i was on my phone when i was doing it i need to look at it on the computer i couldn't it didn't have, seem to have audio with it but if it had audio i was like this is yeah, in it. like insane what yeah. it you know it was able to create an educational roughly 60 second video explaining a concept uh you know that is a pretty difficult concept to to get your head around and within a minute or two i had a video that was professional looking and again there's so many other you know gpts on the store i would recommend anyone to check you know check them out and also there's gonna be more coming from a lot of you know users i think the power is insane because you know for you for example you know you're a recruiter do you write the you know the applications uh, and you know the list of requirements or is that given to you and the, like do, do you write that so we usually actually write that but we right now because the company has been 
you know, posting jobs for a very, very long time. You do That's have true. everything that already exists. But if, let's say, we're creating something that doesn't exist, we will uh, check online. We'll do the research. So absolutely, ChatGPT can help us. And uh, we will check with the hiring managers to confirm that it's, you know, makes sense for their need as well. Yeah. So like pre-AI, how long would it take for you to write up a job application from scratch? You know, with it very could, few bullet yeah. points. It it could take it could take a, a while because um, we had to find you know different pages let's say on Google yeah. uh, see different job ads or what mm. is usually needed for that job but when you just ask ChatGPT it's just gonna give you the whole list that An amazing you know, template yeah. Yeah. yeah and and the beauty of it is within two minutes you could have something and you could look at it and think this is too much of a ser- this is too serious. Like it's a job application, yeah. but we don't want it to be that serious. So yeah. you can you can tell Chat GPT that you can say the tone is too serious. I want it to be not you know childish or casual, but I want it to be like neutral. And then mm-hmm. thirty seconds later, if uh, maybe ten seconds, they've you know there's a a version that's a bit more neutral in tone. Then you can say okay. I want a bit more focus on this, this, and this. I want to expand on this, this, and this. And another thing that I love about it is, especially for someone like yourself, again, I don't know how technical you are, but when I've spoken to recruiters before, they mm-hmm. all, you can tell they're not very technical. And mm-hmm. it's not really their job to be that technical. They're recruiters. But they'll be repeating stuff. And I'm like, what you're saying either doesn't make sense or you're basically just reading off a few notes that you've been mm-hmm. given from, you know, the the art department or the tech department. Yeah. And, you know, you can't really see that, okay, somebody else might have a skill set that is heavily applicable to it, but because it's not using these particular phrases or words, you ignore it. Whereas That's using true. chat GPT, it can you know, pad it out and, you know, get the right terminology, you know, have it verified by someone in the tech or the art department, obviously. Yeah, but yeah. It can, you know, pad something out or you could get an application come in, you could pump that into chat GPT and say, you know, this is the CV that were, you know, this is the job application. This is the CV. Is there like how much of a match do you think this person is? E- even though the technology is, listed on the job application may not be on the actual cv or if they are you don't want to read through it like, I, f- I feel like that's an amazing thing as well because it must be very time consuming for you as a recruiter to go through hundreds of cvs and say okay this one kind of looks all right this one doesn't this one looks amazing if they i'm um, especially if there's a custom gpt or chat gpt powered or ai powered tool that ubisoft has and you can just pump in a thousand cvs and it comes that okay comes up with okay these 50 have a 90 percent plus rating uh of you know being a match the other 95 percent you know ignore like mm-hmm. I, I think that will save a lot of time for someone like yourself and then you could dive heavily into those that five percent so instead of just kind of look glancing over it and then maybe talking to you could then that that's where the human so you know part of it could come where you'll think okay i've got i've gone from a thousand cvs to 50 now and i'm gonna deep dive into each one of these because i don't have that many anymore i've only got five percent compared to having you know all of them yeah yeah i think that could work for for a lot of departments um usually when i used to work in departments where you know it's it's admin heavy or you know it's even programmers, um, I relied 99% on the resume. So I had to go through all these resumes and really understand what each person did and the timeline. So it was definitely very time consuming. And I can see why some companies um, have, you know, uh, these systems that go through the resumes before the recruiters. We don't have that, but I can, I can see why for, for a lot of jobs it would make sense. Um, however, in art jobs, I really go to portfolios. So that's where ChatGPT cannot help me. Yeah, yeah. You know, of <laughs> course, at least not yet. Maybe, yeah. you, know, you know, maybe in the future. But it, it, again, it might be able to help, you know, if, you know, portfolio, I'm guessing you obviously talking about, you know, artwork. Yes. It, again, you know, that question that I had of how do you know 
that that artwork is that particular person's, if you know you can pump it in there and then chat GPT shows that okay, it was you know on these five other locations on the web mm-hmm. and they're clearly not that individual, then you're like, okay, something's not right. Just the way you can have like you know copyright tools and plagiarism tools, I mean, it would be a plagiarism tool effectively, yeah. you know, so that could really help as well. So I feel like the problem with any major technical innovation and AI and chat GPT is definitely, you know, you know, being sort of, I want to say accused of this, but they're, you know, a lot of people are associating it with this is that they're trying to replace something fully you know, like an artist yeah. job or a recruiter's job or a programmer's job, but not realizing that, okay, there's part of your job that takes up a huge amount of man hours, hours that, you know, are important, but you can automate heavily. And, yeah. you know, why not automate that and then leave you to do work that the AI tool can't do, but you can do it to a better standard because you can spend more hours on it. you know exactly. like you know going over the cv you know fine tooth you know going over it speaking to maybe more people instead of speaking to 10 yeah. people the you know before they get to the you know, you know before you put them forward you might speak to 15 20 people and i feel like that's something that a lot of people um because people like to talk uh, about anything in a sensational fashion you know like ai is gonna you know disrupt this injury it's gonna do this it's gonna yeah. do that you never hear anybody say yeah chat gpt the new version's really good it'll help you improve your workflow by 10 percent. that's it like you don't hear that but i feel like that's something that people are missing and not just you know recruiters or employers but also individuals because they're thinking okay Chat GPT clearly can't replace what I'm doing right now, but it doesn't need to. It just needs to enhance what you're doing. Just the way exactly. a computer enhances what you're doing, or the way when I don't know if you remember, but when browsers never had tabs. Do you remember that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I do. I do. Yes, yeah, like and it was just Windows. Like yeah. I, think, I, think, I think there was a time, I'm, I'm pretty sure I remember a time where you could only have one window and then you have multiple windows. And then when you had tabs, it was like, it didn't replace anything, really. It just enhanced the experience. And now you don't want to live without that. And I feel like, you know, ChatGPT and other AI tools is that for most people. It is the tabs. It is something that once you start using, you don't want to go back. But that's not a bad thing. It just enhances, you know, your workflow and the work that you do as well. Exactly. It's like an assistant in a way yes, you exactly. can find out how that assistant can help you and what they can do. Yeah, exactly. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's like the creating the video GPT that I spoke about, you know, you could use it to create videos, but you still need to, let's say, let's say if you're creating a course online, you still need mm-hmm. to plan the course. Okay. You could say you could use chat GPT to, you know, plan, plan the course for you. But you still need to know how to market, you know, stuff. You still need to know how to upload and create good, you know, courses on Udemy, Skillshare, whatever platform, or YouTube, whatever platform it is. There's still a lot of human interaction. I find the more human interaction that you have with these tools, the actually better the output is. It's it's like you can think of ChatGPT like this. If you're the senior, ChatGPT is like having a thousand juniors. Like the yes. juniors can do so much for you. They can do a lot of the grunt work, but there's some stuff that only the senior person with experience and the hands-on knowledge can do. But the but they don't want to do the thousand person junior work either, where you're doing a lot of menial work, especially if it's repetitive. Exactly. And you can tweak it as you need to given you know your expertise and how much you know about the topic let's say the course you're giving so it makes a lot of sense that it can really just make it more efficient oh yeah and you know you know as we're you know wrapping up we're getting to the end of today's podcast yara you know one of the things i always do towards the end is a set of rapid fire fun questions to you know bring the tone out but before we do that i just want to ask what advice would you give to somebody that's looking to get into the games industry, especially now, you know, where there's a lot of turmoil, but just in general, 
and if they are looking to go to a big studio like Ubisoft, because I know a lot of people, if they want to get into the tech or gaming industry, they do have their eyes set on the bigger studios out there. Yeah. Cause, you know, the name and, you know, the, you know, the titles that they've produced and developed, they have, you know, an, an emotional attachment to it. So they would love to work for a Ubisoft, an EA, you know, a, a studio like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the best advice I can give them is to network, mm -hmm. build your own network, especially on LinkedIn, since we talked about it. Um, the more you know people, the more likely they're going to refer you. Um, they're going to give you feedback. They're going to help you out. Uh, a lot of the times people think that networking means sending, let's say, a message just to a recruiter. But in reality, if you connect with those, let's say, intermediate or senior or lead artists that work in your dream company, uh, you send them uh, a message to connect, you ask them for feedback about your work, that could actually help you a lot. And if you build you know, a, a, a bit of a long-term relationship with them, they will definitely refer you uh, once there's an opening on their team because there are a lot of bonuses for them when they do refer someone if that person gets hired. And uh, we get that a lot. We get a lot of people referring friends or family, but even people they've never worked with just because they've been connected with them. Um, and I've seen this make a difference for a lot of juniors. Mm. Okay, I'm, I think that's, you know, really good advice. And, you know, networking is definitely one of those things that I've learned over the years is very, very important. You know, it's yeah. basically make, it's sales. It's making yourself marketable, you know, making yourself, you know, likable and, you know, mm -hmm. coming across in a certain way as well. And, you know, it helps a lot. It's something that, and all our artists and a lot of programmers, they want to be in their bubble and believe that, you know, their work will speak for itself. Mm -hmm. And it will once you get to the table. And even then, exactly. like, a part of it is just you as a person. But you've got to get to that table. Right? Exactly. And part of that is the networking, making yourself, you know, marketable, selling yourself. And, you know, unfortunately, the saying of, if you build it, they will come, most of the time is not true. Most of the time, That's you will true. have to force it down people's throats how you do that uh, you know you know <laughs> we won't go into right now there are some ways that are better for certain industries and products but yeah. yes definitely network is networking is a big you know big thing exactly so getting on to the rapid fire set of questions are you ready for that yara yes let's do it okay so first of all it's a free part actually what's your mm -hmm. favorite movie video game and board game okay okay that's a that's a good question so favorite movie um i think scott pilgrim scott pilgrim for sure i have not it, seen that like oh I, I, my god I, I know it's, it's so cool, good i know it's a cool classic <laughs> kind of, uh, uh, you yeah. know a lot of people do you know f you know fanboy and fangirl over it but i've never yeah. seen it but everything that i hear about it online people like anyone that really has watched it uh and likes likes that type of movie loves that movie so yes I, I think Super I'll go fun. and watch it. Perfect. Um, favorite game? It's hard because every time I play a game, I say that it's my favorite. But mm -hmm. I have to be honest, I've never experienced anything like Red Dead. It's so immersive. The NPCs are so smart. The story is so good. The character development. So, yes, I will say Red Dead, even though it is the last game I played. Uh, yeah, Red Dead. I'm guessing you mean Red Dead Redemption 2, the most recent yes, one? Yes, sorry. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, I, it's amazing i remember playing that when it you know came out you know mm -hmm. morgan's you know arthur morgan's story yeah. i won't spoil it but you know the yeah. end of it as well oh like, my god and yeah that, and, and that because that technically leads into the first red dead redemption yeah. you know as well did you ever play the first one i no, i watched it but i never played it but i watched uh, my uh, my husband play it and it's, okay, it's, yeah, yeah, that yeah. one made. And then they had yeah. One Dead Nightmare, the zombie one, and they've just released yeah. Red Dead Redemption for number one as a remaster as yeah. well. I mean, do you remember the original Red Dead, Red Dead Revolver on PS2? I don't think so, no. Yeah, so I... a lot of people don't know this. The, okay. the, that Red Dead initially was not Red Dead Redemption, it was Red Dead Revolver, which had a lot of the, you know, the, the mechanics where you slow down time you pinpoint different locations on somebody and then, you know, it, you know, it starts pulling off all the shots. 
Like that was mm -hmm. a huge mechanic. I don't, I'm pretty sure Red Dead Revolver was not open world from what I remember. He was on PS2. He says, so, so he's a little while, uh, you know, back. And it was that mechanic that made that game very popular. But it wasn't like as popular as like a GTA or like Assassin's Creed okay. is. But it was when Red Dead Redemption came out and they basically brought those mechanics but into okay. the GTA style open world with that Wild West, you know, theme. Mm -hmm. That's when it blew up on the PS3 and Xbox 360 area. Then with the Undead Nightmare. And then Red Dead Redemption 2 as well. So, yeah, the, that's just a little, you know, fun tidbit for you. I mean, it's, yeah. it's worth Googling and YouTubing Red Dead Revolver. That was I the mean, original Red Dead game. Okay, nice. And what's your favorite board game? Um, You know, I used to play board games a lot. I haven't lately. But I think I think one of the ones I really enjoyed is Catan. I think it's probably a favorite for, for a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people on the podcast... Uh, they either choose Catan or Risk. Like, oh, those are two okay. Games. Nice, nice. Risk is very fun too, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, it, it, Risk and Catan, uh, both of them have, you know, a special place for me just for the reason that I never really knew about. And the Risk I had heard of, but Catan mm -hmm. I don't think I had heard of until I got mm -hmm. married. My wife hadn't, you know played them before we got married okay. but she had heard about them a lot and seen it online and she follows a lot of you know influencers and like american people like mm -hmm. you know vloggers and like they were talking about it and she wanted to play so we bought those games after we got married and at the start of our marriage one thing that we did we played a lot of we played video games because she's a big gamer as well but we played right. a lot of board games and we we went on this you know, crazy buying spree of trying to find all these different <laughs> types of board games, all these different types of Monopoly. I've got this, we bought this Monopoly uh, that's about 70 or 80 years old or something. Oh, like, wow. It's, it's, a, it's a very old, you know, like the actual houses and the hotels are just like wooden pieces. Like they, they, Oh, that's they, so they, cool. They're very, very simple. The money's yeah. very simple. The cards are very simple. Nice. Uh, you know, it, 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 so it's a very, like it's, it's so old that the box for all of the pieces and the money is so small that the board doesn't fit in it. It's when they would give you the board and then the box with all the pieces separately. Whereas now they give you a bigger box and okay. everything goes into it. So yeah, yeah, that's a very old one. And then we got this San Francisco. It's funny, we got this San Francisco version as well, which uh, I knew it was a bit of a rare one. But when I Googled it, it wasn't worth a, a fair bit of money, even used, that uh, like I, we took it out to play it. We, we set it up. I was Googling it because I knew it was a bit of a rare one. Saw how much it was going for on eBay. I packed it up. I was like, we're playing the regular one. I, I, <laughs> we're, not, we're not touching this one. Because <laughs> especially the way, you know, the money gets creased. I was oh, like, no, okay. this is going back on the shelf. But yeah, oh. so Risk and Catan have, uh, have special memories of those nice. games be you nice. know because of you know because of that uh, have you ever played Catan vr the, the the vr version of quest i i did hear about it but i never played it did you uh, yes I, I mean it's actually pretty decent because okay. uh, when we got married i had a quest one and two headset like i gave one headset to my wife one headset okay. you know i had and we literally just sat in bed next to each other and we were playing you know <laughs> you know you know katan uh so i remember you know those memories it was definitely a nice experience because it's in 3d you're in the world like having the board game is also a nice experience sometimes you want that sort of simple real world uh you know experience but the VR version was definitely something to experience if you ever get the chance, especially if oh, you like yeah. it. Yeah, I will try it for sure. So, what video game are you looking forward to? Because there's a lot of great titles um, coming out. Yeah, there's so many titles that I don't even know what to play. But oh, I, I know. think I think I'm really looking forward to the next GTA. Just yes, I mean, you know, we finally had the official yeah. trailer and announcement. Yes, as well. yes. So that was really, really nice. It's exciting. I think it's um, it's is it going to be out this year? No, next year. Oh, next year. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's it's Very a while. So by the time that comes out, the PS Five and Xbox Series consoles will have been out for five years, and oh. uh, <clears throat> you know the typical life's the the typical time span between. 
the release of a console and then the next one is seven years. So this okay. really is going to be like GTA 4, uh, yeah. no, no, sorry, GTA 5, not as bad, but where the, it comes out and then not long after the next console comes out, then there'll probably be yeah. a bunch of remasters and remakes as well. Yeah, I'm excited. I think that's going to be really fun. Uh, what game, obviously that's a game that's not out yet, mm. but what game are you currently, or games are you currently in the middle of or that you have on the back burner? I just started right after finishing Red Dead a few weeks ago, a few days ago. I started Fallout 4, but it is, I'm finding it a little bit difficult uh, given my level, so I'm going to see how it's going to go. Okay, if a Fallout mm-hmm. 4, I mean, that's, that, that's a few years back, that game. Yes. Very, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty old, but it's, uh, I really like the art style and the theme, so yes. that's what really pushed me to, to start it. Okay, uh, now, final question. I, I always love asking this one. It's a two part. Mm-hmm. Does money buy you happiness, and what does a good life mean to you? Oh, wow. Um, I do not think money buys happiness at all. Um, I think a good life is a life where you can appreciate the, the little good moments and be with your loved ones and people that make you feel good and just uh, focus on, you know, the experiences rather than materialistic things. It's so deep, but, you know, <laughs> it is, uh, yeah, it is what I believe in. So Yeah, I mean, that's something that as I'm growing older, I'm 32 now, mm-hmm. plus I got married a few years ago. I've I've just had my second child as well. It's it's those things like you know those little moments yeah. that I'm you know I'm trying to appreciate because my daughter's almost two years old now. My oldest mm-hmm. is, and like those, it, like, I know you hear it from a lot of people that they say, oh, you know, they grow up so fast. It's like she's two, and because we've got our second one, she, he was just born a couple of weeks ago. Oh. It, it, I I was looking at him. I was like, I was kind of missing the newborn phase of my daughter, and I was like. I'm never getting that yeah. back. Like yeah, that's, true. that's never going to come back. And then, uh, you know, she, sometimes, you know, she'll sit next to me and then she'll kind of, you know, cuddle up and she'll mm-hmm. be just, just be eating something. Then she puts it in my mouth and I'm like, there's going <laughs> to come a time. And it won't be long till when she doesn't do that anymore. And then there'll come true. a time where both of them aren't living with us anymore. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, those little moments, you know, obviously you got to focus on work. you got to make money, you know, bills, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But, definitely enjoy those little moments especially if, if you're mm-hmm. lucky enough and privileged enough to have those little moments True. of you know just yeah. blissfulness and you know peace even if if there's a lot of noise going on it's still mm-hmm. peace compared to some of the stuff that's going on in the world so if you have the opportunity exactly. i would say try and take the most of uh, the advantage of it and you know just sit back and you know enjoy those moments it might not be with kids it might be with friends it might be with family it might yeah. be on your own but like sure. try and you know really enjoy you know some of those moments absolutely i think whatever you do if you try to live in the moment and be in the moment even when you're working mm. whatever you're doing i think it makes it a lot more enjoyable for sure yeah it does you know because you know there's merit in having goals in having you know that long-term vision and that plan you know where you want to go you mm-hmm. know those things that you want to achieve but like you said you know living in the moment like you know today thursday i'm working on this you know enjoy that and like you'll have good days you'll have bad days you know obviously acknowledge you know that but then just enjoy the fact that you have that privilege of being able to work have that privilege of being able to you know especially if you're in industry you know like the gaming industry it's i feel like it's a very privileged position to be in versus you know having to stock shelves you know or working free jobs just to make you know ends meet and it's something that i know we can easily forget and not be appreciative of that okay you know yeah yeah, things are difficult but to have that sort of nice position within certain industry is still a privilege absolutely and and we have to look back and see how we've grown and where we started because that's all that also will remind us that you know we're at least halfway where we want to be compared to you know the first jobs we had or what we've been doing so exactly. that's that's very important yeah so this is the end of our podcast today yara but i want to thank you for coming on like you know like we said at the start it's been 
I feel I feel like it's been a year. I'm I'm gonna go back through. <laughs> I feel like it's a year in the making. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I really appreciate you coming on, talking about obviously, you know, your work at Ubisoft, you know, mm-hmm. the industry as a whole, and you know, your advice for people as well. So hopefully you enjoyed it, because you know, I really did. Yeah, it was absolutely great. I really had a good time. I didn't see, you know, all that time pass by so quickly. And thank you so much for having me. No problem. And finally, I want to thank everyone that tuned in to today's episode of Fire with Yara Tabara, uh, you know, who works at Ubisoft. And I'll see everyone in next week's episode of Fire as well. Thank you. Bye bye.